issue of um, Calcidion 28 uh, is a specialized issue and very happy to have at this very conference several people who have written on it in intensely and that uh, the real discussion on it would be real to real advantage to science and a feedback to the uh, coming conference. I think uh, we do have very little time, so I can't address all the issues. But what I would love to do is just to start with a very basic thing, is just to read the canon itself together with you, uh, and then just to address some crucial points which I find extremely um, uh, difficult to resolve and which we have to address. Right? And then I, I would uh, like to have some discussion on it with you. Uh, now, Calcidian 28, the text, uh, the translation is not made by Tanner from his critical edition, which perhaps everyone cites, but by this very man sitting on the other side. Um, so <laughs> I think he would, uh, he would also give some uh, size further, uh, John. Following in every detail the decrees of the Holy Fathers and taking cognizance of the canon just read, of the 150 bishops, dearly beloved by God, who gathered under Theodosius the Great, Emperor's, Emperor of pious memory, in the imperial city of Constantinople, near Rome. We ourselves have also decreed and voted the same things concerning the prerogatives of the most holy church of the same Constantinople, near Rome. For the fathers rightly acknowledged the prerogatives of the throne of Elder Rome because it was the imperial city. And moved by the same consideration by the 150 bishops, beloved by God, awarded a painting, the same prerogatives to the most holy throne of the new Rome. Rightly judging that the city which is honored by the imperial authority and the Senate and enjoys the same civil prerogatives as the imperial city, the Elder Rome, should also be magnified in the ecclesial manners as she being second, second, Devteran Metekein, after them. Consequently, the metropolitans and they alone of the dioceses of Pontius, Aisha and Thrace, as well as the bishops of after-mentioned dioceses who are among the barbarians, shall be ordained by the aforementioned most holy throne of the holy church of Constantinople. Each metropolitan and after aforementioned dioceses, along with the fellow bishops of the province, ordains the bishops of the province, as has been provided for their canons. But the metropolitans of the aforementioned dioceses, as has been stated, shall be ordained by the Archbishop of Constantinople after proper elections have been made according to custom and have been reported to him. Well, this is the text. Um, uh, well, I hope that you could follow what I've been reading and I know that uh, the majority of you already have dealt with it, uh, at least partially. I would like to emphasize a few points uh, for those who perhaps haven't read it sort of most recently. Uh, and then we will return to the uh, crucial issues with it. So uh, the canon consists actually of two sections. Uh, the one is basically um, uh, semi-dogmatic, and the second one is disciplinary, based on the first section. So in sort of this semi-dogmatic section, uh, there is, a, in the beginning, a reference to, the, uh, to another canon from the preceding Ecumenical Council in Constantinople II, uh, which uh, speaks about the prerogatives of, uh, of Constantinople. And uh, there is also a reason advanced by uh, the canon before and this very canon. And the, re the reason is why? Because Constantinople is the second Rome. 
and, uh, and the first room is being mentioned as the other room. Well, and then uh, in the second part, uh, which is a disciplinary sort of as a consequence of the first part, um, uh, now the city of Constantinople receives the rights to ordain the metropolitans, who also can ordain other bishops, in some uh, key other provinces, perhaps smaller ones, but they, they are here, Pontus, Asia, and Thrace. And then there is a, a sort of a long, boring uh, description how it is supposed to be. It is only for the ca ca canon law specialists. But we are not going to deal with that. Uh, we are going to deal with the sort of substance of the matter more. <clears throat> now, uh, this is one of the most controversial canons in the church history. And history of Chalcedon 28 is in many ways the history strangely enough, of absurdities. For instance, one can say that uh, Constantinople, uh, well, uh, as a third Rome, uh, as second Rome, then Moscow can be the third. And then we can follow the same line speaking about Brussels, Washington, Beijing, or you know, whatever. Uh, now, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, the um, terms which, use, which are used in the Chalcedon 28 uh, are not uh, very precise or, and in the modern terms are not very, uh, are somewhat uh, confusing. Uh, as far as the reference to, uh, to, the, uh, to Constantinople II uh, is concerned, the canon uh, which is cited by Chalcedon 28, uh, it is True that it is the same in nature, but there are some additions are made, uh, and they, it is an, an effort to ratify what is stated there about the status of Constantinople, but there are some slight additions. The first slight addition that uh, here we are speaking not only about Constantinople of the second Rome, but we are speaking about the same owner. Uh, which is already an addition because now it tries to equalize Constantinople with Rome. And since uh, uh, the, um, the Pope is not present, it is of course more, it's much easier to communicate the issue. And, uh, and there is uh, another thing what is important in this, uh, in this canon is that uh, in the previous canon of uh, Constantinople too. The problem was that uh, Constantinople was uh, second in place, but yet it didn't have any privileges because it, it didn't even have any canonical territories like the, um, uh, the, the patriarchs of Antiochia and Alexandria and Jerusalem and Rome, of course. And now uh, this canon is given the, uh, the territories which were very weak in history. Uh, and which will help during in the mid-time period by Constantinople, uh, by the rights to Constantinople. Uh, so it is about the uh, sort of first uh, reception. Um, the canon has not been ratified by the first church, the Church of Rome, uh, during the period of ecumenical councils at all. Uh, Saint Leo the Great protested against it uh, to patriarch, the emperor, and emperatrice in many letters. Um, when another formulation of this canon was raised on uh, Nicaea uh, 7, on the similar editions, uh, the Pope was not there either, there were legates, but this canon, as well as many other canons, well, the majority of them, of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, were not ratified by Rome. So this canon is, uh, this council is the sort of still even more ambiguous than uh, then the situation with Chalcedon, where only one canon was under the big uh, question. <clears throat> uh, what I would like now just to address is the several issues which are often raised, but I would like just to add to them a few others, uh, very shortly, uh, which are problematic with this uh, canon. Some of them uh, of the doctrinal canon uh, uh, idea, and some of them have a technical or um, uh, linguistic uh, difficulties. If you would just really uh, simplify it down to the matters, we can say who are the winners and who are the losers of this very canon, if it is accepted. 
the winners are two. One is real, another in Spain. The real one is the ecumenical uh, patriarchy, well, of that time, but uh, in, in many ways up until these days it, it actually inherits the, uh, the advantages of acceptance of the canon. And uh, another one is, uh, strangely enough, Moscow. Uh, well, because Moscow also has pretenses of sort of in history uh, to replace Constantinople, at least in the periods when it has lost its rise as the imperial city. Uh, but of course, uh, uh, I would just sort of uh, ironically uh, compare those two positions. First as an Antiochian, another one as the Alexandrian. Antiochian in a way because the interpretation is a bit uh, too straightforward and literal, which is not up to date. And the second one is too uh, ambiguously uh, symbolic and allegorical, uh, which where you, uh, if you continue along the same lines, you can arrive anywhere. Uh, now, who are the losers? Uh, well, uh, in the history at that time, it was, of course, ancient pa patriarchies, such as Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. Uh, which were degraded, so uh, from the second to the third, and from the third to the fourth, and so on places. Uh, the second, which is not obvious, but uh, it was still the case, the status of Rome's primacy was undermined. Uh, not because it lost its first position, but it was equalized first, and secondly, because it lost, uh, according to this council, the prerogative to, uh, to give uh, the status to another church uh, in the order of priorities. Uh, because the position of Rome as the first um, a patriarchy was actually in the end ignored. <clears throat> and then uh, the possible losers along the same lines, of course, uh, are possible uh, new candidates for autocephaly uh, autonomy and where uh, actually the issue of diaspora, which addresses the problems of possible let's say, Western of American autocephalic can be addressed. If this issue is not resolved, it is very difficult to advance further on. Uh, there is uh, an obvious difficulty with this canon, strangely enough, but nobody speaks about this, the, uh, the difficulty of spirituality. Um, the, uh, the spiritual claims of this, um, of this canon are minimal. It, it, it does not mention gospel at all, nothing what is implied in it, uh, nor there is any reference to any father of the church who was at uh, that time at all, only to the numbers of the fathers, which is an abstraction, of course. On the contrary, uh, Christ never argued against the anything of a kind, of such uh, something to say that Rome, for instance, might be, uh, might, must have a primacy of honor of worship, worship, worship in his Jesus' father because it was the city of the emperor, Tiberius. This complete, complete absurdity. Yesterday, Noel uh, Refu has already cited uh, a very nice quote uh, from the Gospel this, in the similar context from the uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, 10, saying that if you wish to be the first, you have to be the last, and you have to be the servant. And uh, here, of course, we are talking about the tendency the other way around. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into it, but, uh, but I'll fo uh, follow on the uh, other absurdities which are sort of present there, like um, the mentioning of importance, for instance, of the Senate, which is uh, mentioned in the canon as a sort of prero gives prerogatives to Constantinople. Uh, uh, which is, uh, if you, to follow this line, we have to think what Senate can perhaps uh, uh, give uh, similar prerogatives. Of course, there is none. <clears throat> but even uh, mentioning such a world institution as Senate is just completely out of context of such an important uh, matter. Uh, another issue of the emperor's importance. <laughs> yeah, uh, emperor's importance. Uh, Theodosius the Great is mentioned, but he's not present. It is about the, uh, uh, the previous um, council. Uh, but uh, we do also know that the last emperor has disappeared in 1456. Uh, so we do not have uh, an emperor uh, who is to address uh, 
to represent his person? Would it be Obama, Barroso, Putin, Yanukovych, or Lukashenko? Uh, perhaps it's better. <laughs> um, then there is another important issue which is addressed in the second part of the, um, of the canon. It is the issue of distribution of uh, those um, metropol metropolities based on the uh, addressing of the issue of barbarians. So, uh, so the Constantinople has to be in charge of all the territories which uh, do not belong to any other uh, uh, patriarchy. Um, and then, well, along this line, also the other metropolities. But then, uh, who are uh, the candidates for the barbarians, let's say, in the posterior periods? Well, the French, Belgians, Italians, Spanish, Catholic, or Swiss, uh, Catholic, or perhaps American, uh, Dutch, English, Protestants, uh, or perhaps, I don't know, maybe, maybe better, Turkish, Arab, uh, Iranian, Muslims. And I think even that does not ring the bell. Um, even if we just go on the, along this line, speaking about the Chinese uh, um, or Korean communists, uh, if they are barbarians, then perhaps we have to go there and just proselytize or do missionary work, which is completely absent uh, uh, from the point of view of any candidates of, uh, of the primacy. Yet what uh, rests as the difficulty, uh, the great importance, and which is a very important issue for the coming council, is the, uh, uh, the problem of consiarchy. That is uh, uh, the problem that if the emperor falls out, who used to convoke the ecumenical councils or whatever councils, who is going to replace him? Uh, fortunately for the Catholic Church, they have the Pope also, there are many other problems, but he has the right to convoke the Council. Peter de May, uh, actually in his presentation, really beautifully uh, 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 presented the way how the Vatican II uh, commenced when the Pope came, uh, the new Pope, just one of the first degrees, he said, well, there will be a Council. So he pushed it through and there was a Council. Uh, great council, there's all contradictions, but yet it, it took place. In the Orthodox Church, there is no authority whatsoever uh, of this kind. And in this case, of course, there is a necessity that someone would replace, well, uh, entre guillemets, the status of, uh, uh, of, um, um, of, Constant, uh, of, of Rome. Uh, well, now I'll proceed to what I would like to claim and to sort of what is important aspect of that, which is also a kind of conclusion. Uh, it is about economy. Uh, Balsamon, a great uh, uh, orthodox canonist, um, who stood in the cradle of creation of Pedalion, which is Komsha, the collection of the orthodox canon laws, had a rather historical approach toward the canon law, seeing that it was liable to development. Among the canons, there is a crucial distinction should to be made. Um, two different types. One, the canons treat in the dogmatic issues which concern the do doctrines, such as the Nicene Creed, of the def definition of faith, of, uh, uh, or of the creed. And second, the canons concerning the discipline such as, for instance, the bishops cannot be moved from one seat to another, one of the decrees of the First Ecumenical Council, which is not applied at all these days in the Orthodox Church in none of them. Um, uh, there is another the absurd uh, canon, which is also true canon, uh, that the priests may not be con um, ordained after, under the age of 30, which is not respected anywhere. Uh, well, this is a kind of disciplinary important canon, but uh, it is not comp comparable to the one. Pope Leo the Great clearly made this distinction, signing the definition of faith and refusing to sign canon 28. Cre clearly, Chalcedon 28 does not belong to the doctrinal canons, as sometimes it is tried to be seen, but a disciplinary canon, whereas the economia, as an exception, perhaps, and must be re uh, applied. A new formulation addressing perhaps a similar need must be expressed and updated. Thank you.